I'm Jane McCallion. And I'm Adam Shepherd. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. This week, we've got some very exciting news to share with you all. We are launching our first ever virtual conference. That's right. While we are all locked in our houses, that doesn't have to mean that the learning and insights stop. So we are launching IT Pro Live, which is going to be a five day event running from the 22nd to the 26th of June. It will be free to attend, uh, entirely virtual. And we have a number of amazing speakers, including the CIO of Box, Paul Chapman, the CISO of Just Eat, Kevin Fielder, Rebecca George OBE, the president of the British Computing Society, the CTO of RSA, the field CTO of Puppet, and many, many more. Yeah, it's it's such a good lineup. I'm really looking forward to it as well, you know, both in terms of somebody who's obviously on the organising and hosting side of things, but also effectively as an attendee. Mm, We're going to have some really, really interesting uh, panel discussions, Q&As. One thing I'm particularly excited for is uh, we're going to have a closing keynote from the CEO of Echo, which is an online pharmacy that has been helping the NHS with fulfilling prescriptions. So in the current climate particularly, I think that's going to be a very exciting session indeed. And also for anybody else who's feeling like me a little bit all at sea, as I would have normally been to a couple of uh, real life conferences by now, hopefully that can sort of start to solve our hankering for some kind of tech get together. If you're feeling the need to scratch that conference itch, you can go to live.itpro.com to register for your free ticket now. There will be links in the show notes and in the episode description, as well as links all over the site. Okay, and now on to our top news story of this week, which is that Microsoft is offering a bounty of $100,000 to white hat hackers to break into Azure Sphere. That's right. Sphere is the company's IoT management platform, and uh, Microsoft has quite a good record of relying on bug bounties and bug bounty programs to identify holes in its uh, software, uh, of which there have been over the last kind of year or so many, I think (laughs) it's fair to say. We've covered in previous episodes the torrents of patches for things like Windows, the company's server software, you know, various products that the company has uh, utilized bug bounties heavily to identify and solve. Yeah, and you know, like as you say, it's not unusual for Microsoft to engage in this kind of um bug bounty or you know, kind of vulnerability hunting activity. Uh, I think it's also worth noting, though, that Azure Sphere is Linux based, not Windows based. Um, Linux among the community does have, a, you know, a worthy or not reputation for being more secure than a lot of other operating systems. Um, so I wonder if there's not a, a bit of that in the whole kind of come and have a go if you think you're hard enough equivalent of InfoSec. <laughs> Well, I think the the whole reputation of Linux as being inherently more secure has a lot to do with it being open source and, you know, the whole theory of many eyes being able to catch and identify problems more quickly. Mm. Now, there are you know counter arguments to this. The discovery of the Heartbleed OpenSSL bug is one that's frequently brought up, which was undiscovered for, I think, 20 some years before it was mm-hmm. eventually found and patched. But... In fairness, you don't tend to see as many critical vulnerabilities popping up in open source software as you do in the likes of Microsoft and Oracle and SAP's technology, just to name a couple of companies with recent large patch updates. Anyone looking to participate in the Azure Sphere Research Challenge, as it's being called, uh, should submit an application to Microsoft before the 15th of May this year. So that is exactly one week from when this podcast is broadcast. Your application will be reviewed and if you are accepted, you will apparently be notified via email. We will, of course, uh, include a link to the application page in the show notes. 
Moving on, the UK continues to lag behind other countries in terms of the stability of its online services, following the news that despite a decline in average internet outages, the UK's level of outages still remains steadily high. Yes, this is according to research from Thousand Eyes, uh, which was carried out between the 27th of April and the 3rd of May. Uh, apparently, the most of uh, the disruptions were ISP based. This includes uh, the widespread Virgin media outage that affected the UK, Ireland and in fact the Netherlands last week. Uh, even if you're not a Virgin media user, I don't think that you could have possibly escaped the news that it was happening, especially if you happen to be present on Twitter at all. Mm. I wonder what this particular study says about how the UK is working from home at the moment. Like, is it just a question that we are using more online services more heavily than other countries? Or is it to do with our actual broadband infrastructure that can't handle the demand? Difficult to say. I mean, it could be a bit six or one half dozen of the other. Oh, you know, infrastructure is notoriously rubbish. And I'm pretty sure that I have spoken on a previous episode of the podcast uh, about you know, kind of how surprised I was to find out that how bad the UK is in comparison with the rest of Europe. Uh, mm, especially, several times, in fact. Well, yeah. And you know, kind of hark back to when I was in Spain, where we didn't have you know, internet in our in our house and you had to go across to the cyber cafe and the idea of having internet in our house was a bit extraordinary whereas i had it in you know halls and shared house and stuff and now you know spain is infinitely better than the uk in terms of network infrastructure um i mean you know, and obviously this <laughs> i imagine the priority of uh, you know, giving everybody gigabit or super fast internet by 2025 has possibly been shoved back a bit by the whole um coronavirus well, issue but you say that but it's arguably more important now than it's ever been yes and if you want to employ a little bit of keynesian economics or keynesian whichever whichever you prefer then a massive uh, public works project like upgrading the entire internet infrastructure of the country is you know, a, a great way a great way to go about it i think the ongoing upgrade programs to the UK's broadband infrastructure are going to have to be prioritised if this crisis goes on for any length of time. But of course, it's going to be more difficult to do those upgrades if you want to have workers being able to you know, maintain safety and do social distancing and whatnot. It's hard to dig up a road in a socially distanced manner, <laughs> I'd imagine. But, it, but this is kind of decoupled a bit from the crisis. The crisis has uh, been a spark for a change in the way that people work. But you know, all over our site, all over you know, other places, Financial Times, BBC, you, everyone can't stop talking about the fact that you know this is probably um, the 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 impetus for a genuine change that moves us generally towards more home working if we're able to. And while I'm often sceptical about this kind of hype, uh, I think I think they're really onto something here. So even once we've kind of got a handle on COVID, I, I think that this will still be um, just really important for the economy, you know, kind of Keynesian economics aside, you know, kind of actually just keeping people going in, in, in a way that they want to work. Mm. And it will pay dividends later down the line. And finally, we've got something of a blast from the past, as the creator of the notorious love bug virus has come clean 20 years after it first appeared. Mm. And this makes a rather neat counterpoint to our story that we discussed on last week's episode about hackers having sudden attacks of conscience. Yeah, so it's not quite that he's uh, grown a conscience in the same way that the uh, guys or possibly gals uh, from last week have. You know, it's love bug isn't exactly doing the rounds anymore. I hmm. yeah, appreciate that you were like a fetus at the time that this happened, <laughs> <laughs> and well, not I was quite. <laughs> I, I was admittedly kind of you know legally a child, um, but I do kind of have a vague memory of it, and it's it's. It's funny, you know, kind of that late 90s, early 2000s period was when your know, viruses really started to kind of pick up on you know, the kind of general public consciousness. Although, you know, admittedly, Love Bug was, was a big deal. Mm. 
But it harkens back to what is, in my mind, a more innocent age of cybercrime, where malware was designed not to you know, harvest information or hold data to ransom or exfiltrate company secrets, but primarily just to mess with people. It was essentially like really, really devastating pranks. Yes, yes. A, a lot of the time it was, and you kind of got screen knocker ransomware, which is you know, a, a very innocent version of what we have. The guy behind it, who is called Onel de Guzman, uh, he did initially create the bug as a way to steal internet access passwords, which I'm sure many of our listeners will remember as well. You, know, you couldn't just couldn't just hop on the internet when we had dial up. You had to have a password. So it was kind of credential stealing. But yeah, yeah. Beyond that, he, he just wanted to freely access the uh, access the internet. Now, interestingly, de Guzman was actually a suspect in the initial investigation uh, due to the fact that the signature for the virus originated in the Manila apartment that he shared with his brother. But due to the fact that at the time the Philippines had no hacking laws on the statutes, he basically got off scot-free. Yeah, and, you know, uh, you possibly you, know, you might think, oh, my goodness, how is this possible in, you know, kind of year 2000? There's no hacking laws. Really, hacking laws are, are quite new. The Computer Misuse Act in the UK you know, first came in in the 90s after an attempt to break into um, some of the personal information of the Duke of Edinburgh by a couple of journalists, and it was discovered that there was no... Um, Really, there was no nothing on the statute books that would would cover that off, and you know it's been evolving. But before the most recent update of UK law, it, it was previously harking back to 1998, and it's you know, this whole thing of legislation always lags behind technology, and you know the Philippines was no different. But really, you know, a few years before that, we were no different either. Yeah, I mean, legislators keeping up with tech development is always going to be a tough battle. I mean, tech moves at such a rapid pace, as we were discussing with Professor Mark K. Smith in a previous episode. Technology moves at such a rapid pace that it is almost impossible for legislators to keep up. I mean, you know, both in terms of managing how companies interact with technology and how they're allowed to use it, but also cyber criminals are quite often inventing crimes that don't exist yet in a lot of cases. <laughs> You've taken on a very 1980s movie tone there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I aim for. We're going to take a short break now, but when we get back, we will be speaking to Alison Davis, who is CIO of the Natural History Museum. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, we're joined this week by Alison Davis, who is the CIO of the Natural History Museum. Now, you may think of the Natural History Museum as a big grand building that's full of dinosaur bones and interesting natural history specimens and exhibits, which it is. And it's a great day out. If you haven't been, I thoroughly recommend it. But that's not all that the Natural History Museum is. It's actually a functioning research institute at the same time. To talk to us about how data and technology play an integral part of this, welcome to the podcast, Alison Davis. Thank you. Hello, Adam. Hello, Jane. So, Alison, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the dual function of the Natural History Museum and how you balance the challenges of running a functioning research institute at the same time as one of the country's most beloved museums. Thank you. Yes, I joined the museum in February of this year, so I've, I've been the CIO for a relatively short time, and obviously um, it's been affected to some degree by having been shut out since March. <laughs> mm. um, but you're right, when people think about the museum, uh, an awful lot of them think about the dinosaurs. They are much beloved, and I have to confess that after I joined, I posted my fair share of dinosaur selfies <laughs> before we shut down um, since when I've been working from home. But you're right, there's so much more to the museum than these incredible and much-loved specimens. We've got some 80 million 
different specimens and we actually have the largest volume of what are called type specimens in the world. Type specimens are what one might consider the index example of a particular species. So they're the original example which is used as the reference so that when someone finds a new species of blue fly they come and compare it with the type specimens around the world to make sure that their specimen is actually a new species. Oh wow! Uh, the, the Natural History Museum has the largest number of type specimens in the world, uh, more than the Smithsonian for example. So scientists can and do use the museum collections for research and that's really important because by using the past data we're not just looking at the past, we're also able to extrapolate this data forward into the future and say what that means for humanity, for biodiversity and for the planet. My background isn't actually in museums as a CIO, my background is all in life sciences and in research. I was originally a research chemist at Glaxo way back in the day uh, and that's the area I've stayed around and so it was interesting that the museum was specifically looking for a CIO who had a research background and who could understand the IT and data technology requirements that are needed around supporting a research organisation. So yes, it's, it's an interesting balance. We clearly have retail activities that go on in our shops and we have tills at our electronic point of sale and then we have research on the other hand. That's quite an interesting almost kind of cross-skilling story that you've got there Alison you're moving from uh, pharmaceuticals uh, into museums and, and that kind of natural kind of scientific scientific that kind of you know, I guess it's in the same kind of field, you know, biological research, but you know, at the macro level rather than the micro level. Is that kind of how you see it yourself? Yes, my passion's always been as a scientist. I was a fairly um, average bench chemist, I would say, and my father, who's a biochemist, would probably be even more damning about my, my scientific <laughs> capabilities. <laughs> um, but what I have loved is being able to be in a technological role that supports science and being able to have those conversations. So I, my job from 2013 to 2018, I was the inaugural CIO of the Francis Crick Institute, which was again, basic research, but as you say, much more at the molecular level than, than the macro level. But it, it's all science and it's all about, whether that, that's about specific things that are benefiting society at the moment, such as the Crick being involved in some of the COVID testing, or whether that's about trying to save the planet and the climate change emergency that the Natural History Museum has declared as part of its strategy. So what are some examples of uh, research that you are doing at the Natural History Museum? Obviously, you've spoken about the type specimens. It sounds like um, you know, climate change is quite a big part of the research that's being done there as well. So just to pick up on those two examples of the type specimens, actually, museum scientists identified 412 new species in 2019, which I think would be news to a lot of people. I, I tend to think we've discovered everything, we've explored this planet and we know what's out there. But actually there are still new species to discover and museum scientists are involved with that. So yes, 412 new species identified in 2019. Um, we're still learning about the dinosaurs, the favourite topic of the museum, <laughs> and dinosaur teeth are being analysed to learn more about British dinosaur diversity. There are still things we can learn. And there were dinosaurs in the UK. I think someone told me there was a triceratops found in London. I'm, I may be oh, getting wow. the wrong dinosaur. But uh, yeah, so there, there were British dinosaurs and we're still learning about them. But looking, looking to the future as well as the, the past and present, as I said in the museum strategy, we have declared a climate change emergency and a lot of the research is focused on that sort of um, goal of trying to save the planet. So just to pick up a couple of examples of research in that area, uh, for the first time ever all the known plant species growing in the Amazon have been listed and the scientists at the museum have been involved with that and that and doing that correctly helps to underpin the future studies that show how the rainforest is evolving and to help with conservation work and the rainforests are critical to the planetary survival. It also is being digitised and geo-referencing being used 
so that again we can help to understand how things are evolving in particular locales hmm. so that's one area um, then coming closer to home in understanding UK biodiversity uh, we have approximately 66,000 known species in the UK and there's a project called the Darwin Tree of Life which is being run by the, the Welcome Sanger is a 10-year project and it's going to sequence the genomes of all the UK species so there's been the, the, the 10K genomes and the 100K genome projects for human genome, which people tend to think about. But if you think about then taking that to all species, not just humans, um, that's a huge complexity. Yes, I, I uh, read fairly recently, actually, um, although this is probably not news to biologists, uh, that you know, despite looking similar, rabbits and hares are actually not particularly um, closely related and that's presumably something you'd see at a genetic level because if you just look at them you kind of go wow a long-eared rodent that hops around and stuff <laughs> one is slightly bigger than the other um, so yeah I find you know all that kind of research is I think very interesting and very important in your role as a CIO and obviously heading up the IT department within the Natural History Museum what is your role in supporting this research? So my team provide the, the platforms that underpin the science that we're doing. Uh, I'm also responsible for the digitization team um, in conjunction with science. So we're actually jointly involved in the endeavor around digitizing the collection. Uh, we have some four and a half million specimens already digitized. In addition to that, we're providing the, the scientific computing platforms for people to store the data we're migrating data to the cloud. Uh, I was interested in what you said in the introduction about Azure because that's a platform we're using. So, <laughs> so I should be following that white hat hacking with interest. Um, so yeah, it's very much about providing a capability and enablement. And at, at the more normal level that any organization would recognize, we provide the kit, the laptops, the support, the access to data, that is particularly important at the moment. Now all of the museum is working from home. So there are different levels up to and including, as I said, the digitization of specimens where the team that I look after get involved. As my as CIO, my role is to be interested in all of the digital data and technology that goes across the museum, whether it's my direct team delivering it or whether it's being done by other people. So just going back to what you were saying about digitization, uh, obviously, you know, one of the problems with the lockdown from the perspective of a researcher, particularly, you know, a natural history or life sciences researcher that kind of needs specimens to work with and that kind of thing. Uh, has that digitization effort meant that at least some of the work of those researchers can continue whilst in lockdown? So, as I mentioned previously, we have a data portal which you can find online and it has approximately four and a half million of the museum's 80 million specimens catalogued in there in different data sets. So, for example, you can view some of the museum's butterfly reference material, which actually not only is scientifically interesting, but quite pretty. Um, so is that freely available? Yeah, that's freely available. Um, it is at data.nhm.ac.uk, if I can give it a quick plug. Of course. Um, and it's used by scientists. It can be used by the public just for interest. It's used by scientists. It's cited regularly in scientific papers. And what they can do is they can use the data sets for research. That can, that's all accessible from home. It's also useful for people who do want to come into the museum and see the physical specimens because it means you can look and see if we've got something before you actually have to come and literally root through drawers. Uh, the museum is a fascinating place. The corridor that I normally work on when I would be there is um, in the basement. IT is often tucked away in the basement. <laughs> uh, and we have cupboards along the corridor of mollusks and things that are of, of things that <laughs> I don't get to see, but I know are in there because they're labelled. And it's really fascinating that you know, there's all this stuff tucked away behind the scenes, not just what you see out on display. What, what you see in the museum, if you come as a visitor, is very much the, the shop window. The vast majority of specimens are tucked away. So being able to look at the, the digitised information before you come and look at a specimen is also a good use for scientists' time. That's 
fascinating. I never really considered that. I mean, you know, I suppose it makes sense that, you know, Dippy the Diplodocus is probably more of a draw for the general public than 18 cases of mollusks. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Speak I never... Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's but also there are, there are some things we can't display because it's practically difficult. So we have a, a room called the Spirit Room and, and you can, when the museum is open, there are tours um, that can be arranged. But that's um, the Spirit Room refers to the fact that it's actually things kept in alcohol um, or from alcohol, yes. but mostly alcohol, I think. So we've got a giant squid down there. That's uh, yes. right. You do, yeah, you do tours of that as part of your uh, late night uh, season. I really wanted to go to that uh, last year because it looks fascinating, but I didn't actually get the chance. I must. Uh, I must make time next time they're on. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it is an amazing environment to work in, and as someone who is a former scientist, although chemistry rather than biology, it's just yeah, it's my ideal job. It's been great fun. Do the scientists have a pet name for the giant squid? It's called Archie. Ah, oh, of course um, it is. So he's called Archie, which relates to the, the formal Latin name, which is unpronounceable. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on from the research side of the Natural History Museum's work, fascinating though it is, I understand that the museum does an awful lot of work around data literacy and data education as it relates to STEM in the UK. Can you tell us a little bit more about the museum's work in that area? Um, I haven't been exposed very much to the museum's work in that area as, as yet. We have a lot of educators who work around the museum and I've seen them at work, um, particularly setting up actually dinosaur expeditions near Sophie the Stegosaurus in the morning. So often when I walk in, <laughs> which is a, a real privilege walking to South Kensington, I'm disappointed I'm not doing it at the moment. Uh, when I walk into the museum in the morning past Sophie the Stegosaurus, often our educators are setting up um, things in order to do a demonstration to schools or to, to groups. Um, but I do have a personal passion about this. I, I'm actually a school governor at a local school and I'm a member of the trustees for another school. And I've got a passion for encouraging education in STEM subjects. And actually my role at the Crick, someone in the education team there, said something that really stuck with me which is that the likelihood of someone pursuing a career in STEM beyond school, kids will say they like STEM subjects at school, but they tend not to go into them as a career. And the likelihood of them doing that depends on how much STEM capital they have been exposed to. So the idea that children can accrue this through their environment, but also through exposure to opportunities like visiting the museum, was something that I'd never really considered. But then, as I said earlier, my, my father is a biochemist. Uh, my grandfather taught maths. My mother was a lab technician, so I was completely <laughs> immersed in, in STEM capital in those terms. Uh, so I think the first thing that we have to do is, is to make sure that all children have that exposure, not just people like me who happen to be lucky enough to be sheep dipped in it at a young age. <laughs> and, and that's what places like the museum and the Crick are doing. And I think it's, it's fantastic. As I said earlier, I did the dino snores sleepover with my kids when they were younger and with three of their friends. And we got to go around the museum behind the scenes after hours and be able to, I think we created plaster dinosaur footprints and we did all sorts of things. And that really helped to open their eyes. My son now wants to be a biochemist which possibly partly Aww. runs in the genes, but also <laughs> will relate to how much he's had these opportunities. As so. a biochemist, presumably you can literally tell whether or not it runs in the genes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, in terms of data literacy specifically, that's an interesting one because I think schools aren't really teaching that enough. And that's going to be a core skill that we need not just in science, but actually the industry needs across all sorts of functions, not just in IT, not just in research. And schools don't have data science typically as a formal part of the curriculum. And when they talk about teaching IT, they talk about teaching the technology. But we really, really need to start teaching data science. I totally agree. I think the kind of practical applications of data and data literacy are really, really underemphasized at the school level. Now, I mean, bearing in mind the last time I was 
after school was several years ago now. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's, it is too often related to maths and computing and not to the, the wider applications throughout not just business and industry, but life in general, that knowing how to properly analyze and interpret data can have. Yeah, I, and I must say, you know, kind of, you know, also from from a journalist's point of view, it's something that Dr. Ben Goldacre raises in his book Bad Science is the problem, you know, with identifying what is valuable and what's not when it comes to data and research. You know, is a survey of two hundred people really useful? Well, I guess it depends who those people are, but if it's supposed to be a sample of the general public, then no, and you. Know, I don't know if you feel the same, Alison, that this is you know, an important part of data literacy as well. Yes, hugely. I think, you know, as Adam just said, data skills are relevant to life, not just business. And the ability to evaluate data effectively uh, when we are all bombarded with information, those skills are going to be critical in order to be able to make informed judgments. And it's as basic as things like being able to access healthcare information more effectively. Now, if you can engage with the information around your illness around your treatment, then you can actually ask for more effective treatment. And I think that is going to be a bigger risk than, say, postcode prescribing. Mm. I think actually the, the risk to health of people not being information literate is huge. And the, the need to be able to educate people about health, and we're seeing this a little bit, obviously, in the current environment with COVID, Mm. Yeah, making your own assessment on the statistics, which are really difficult to analyse, and I've been looking at them and you know, understanding what those stats mean when actually the, the researchers don't yet know. You know are, are, are countries including deaths in care homes? Are they not? You know, trying to be able to, to wade through that and, and by extension then assess fake news over information that has value becomes a real life skill. I think the role of data in fighting COVID-19 is huge. I, I think that while in the early days of the pandemic, it was understandable that different countries took different approaches because none of us could really be sure what was going to work or how the virus would evolve. It now seems clear that the data from the data, it now seems clear from the data that those countries that have effectively employed test and trace approaches, coupled with strong quarantine, have really managed to avoid the worst of things. So I think that tracing app is going to be critical. Um, I'm very excited and interested to see how that's done because I think there are some huge challenges in terms of reassuring the public that the data will be handled appropriately, but I, I'm certainly going to be signing up for it. Well, I think, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this week. Much as I would uh, love to continue talking about dinosaurs and research and coronavirus data for the next couple of hours, uh, we are going to have to wrap it up there, unfortunately. Uh, thank you once again to Alison for joining us. Thank you. You can find links to all of the topics we've spoken about today in the show notes and even more on our website, www.itpro.co.uk. Or head to live.itpro.com to sign up for our virtual conference. You can also follow us on Twitter at ITPro as well as Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to subscribe to the IT Pro podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher or wherever else you find podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. We'll be back next week with more news and analysis from the world of IT. Until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.